Hello and welcome to episode 87 part 1 of Awesome Astronomy for September 2019. It is the fate of all systems to fall into disorder and chaos. As time passes with its unyielding and apparent inevitability, the amount of thermal energy available for work decreases and the decay of what was once ordered becomes unavoidable. Entropy, as a second law of thermodynamics, is at pains to point out cannot decrease in an isolated system, and this means there is an irresistible march towards thermal equilibrium. Randomness takes over, lack of information dominates. Will I make a pithy analogy between entropy and the current chaotic, data-poor, randomly idiotic politics of the world? <laughs> I will not. Because ultimately, while the new Prime Minister of the UK and the incumbent of Pennsylvania Avenue might both appear to be leaking chaos from the very follicles on their heads, and the President of Brazil appears to be literally intent on burning the atmosphere of the planet, these things are not the result of the physics of the universe. They are, of course, purely down to the stupidity of humans. An animal that allows the President of Russia to build nuclear-powered missiles. A species that thinks tiny, almost insignificant differences in a tiny percentage of DNA somehow create radically different and categorizable races. An organism that would rather surround its young with weapons and body armour than rewrite a piece of paper. A group of apes so insecure and vain they created Facebook and Instagram. A creature so stupid it can't be asked to walk a couple of miles to get takeout food and thus not only increase the decline of the very atmosphere and climate on which it depends, but also makes itself fatter. Exponentially. <laughs> Humans, you've only got yourself to blame for the chaos. Leave the physics out of it. But in an age-old twist, let us forget our troubles and turn instead to the cold rationality and heartless indifference of the universe beyond. A universe that cares not if you are wholly stupid in your entire mind and will never question your weird politics or your pathological hatred of refugees and 16-year-old girls in sailing ships because ultimately you are an insignificant speck in a cosmos that hasn't even noticed you exist. Your scream for recognition, your arguments in favour of whatever it is you truly believe, the anger you display, whatever petty squabble you have with another fat ape of your incredibly stupid species doesn't even echo in the vast 13.78 billion year old universe. It's a vacuum. It doesn't care. And if it was somehow conscious, it ultimately knows that entropy will swallow you in an amount of time so small that it probably couldn't be bothered to even measure it. But joining me, though, are two apes that are far from insignificant. That breaker of all laws of thermodynamics, Jenny. Cooey. And a man who laughs, nay, spits in the eye of the standard model, Ralph. <laughs> Ding. <laughs> Please actually put you making that sound in, not like a computer-generated version of that sound. <laughs> hello, hello, darlings. How hello. are how hello. are we? Good. Toasty. It's a bit warm, isn't it? It's a bit warm, yeah. isn't it? I, I, oof, I, oh, yeah. could we be any more British? The first thing we talk about on the podcast is the bloody weather. Oh no! To be fair, it's pretty Amazonian in here. Oh, the hot. Yeah, in, the, in that chamber. Goodness me. <laughs> it's the hottest Coconuts. it's the hottest <laughs> late August bank holiday on record isn't it yeah it is mm. yeah. oh is it yeah yeah, mm. yeah I was working outdoors today it was hot it's pretty cloudy in Cardiff to be honest ah but that's Wales <laughs> yeah when is it not cloudy yeah <laughs> here oh god it's been it's been beautiful blue skies and just heat 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 and you were out sketching last night I was out actually astronomizing last night Ooh. for myself and not anybody else. Well, hey, which is the nice. first time. Literally, I opened my sketchbook and the last sketch in there was the twelfth of February. Wow! Wow! I know. I know. I was six actually, months. I six. Yeah, and uh, finally out doing, and it was beautiful last night. Oh, it was clear. I noticed looking around um, bedreaded uh, social media last night that there were a lot of people out astronomizing mm. and a lot of people out sketching too, it, uh, which was good to see. So I wonder if that's to do with the skies gradually starting to darken and the mm -hmm. fact that it's nice and warm if you've got your gin and tonic yeah. in there. Oh, and it was really transparent last night as well for summer. 
because even when it's clear in summer in the UK, um, it, it can be not that transparent. Mm. But by gum, last night it was tra- it was really clear last night. It was one of those nights where you're looking for faint things, you put your scope on it, and on a typical August night, you'd go, ah, I can't see it. It's not there. <laughs> it, it's clearly the transparency is not good enough. Last night, everything I looked at was there. Brilliant. Amazing. Really clearly. It was beautiful last night. So yeah, I had a nice, nice little session last night. What did you have a look at? I hopped around Aquila. I I looked at faint fuzzies in Aquila. Um, which nice. Is not is not one I'd actually really explored before. So there's a bunch. No, of it's a nice big constellation, isn't mm. it? But there's not actually a lot of big objects in there. No, no. But surprisingly, there's actually a very big planetary in there um, mm. called the Snow Globe. Is the is the nickname for it? Um, and it's quite big. It's um, it's bigger than the Ring Nebula. Oh, oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It appears bigger than much, much bigger than. It, it's a it's a sizable sort of blob of of planetary nebula. Um, yeah, and the Ring Nebula is pretty easy to find. It's re- the Ring Nebula is easy to find because it's bright, but it's really small. Yeah, it's also in a very easy place to spot. It's right between two stars. Exactly, this is exactly. True. You put your finder scope between, in the, and it just it's there, but it's really small. But it's just bright, so it's it's really obvious. Mm. This one is dimmer, but much much bigger. Mm. So it's it, a bit like the dumbbell or something. Yeah, like a sort, but like a sort of fainter dumbbell. Mm. Um, not quite as big as a dumbbell, but but getting towards that sort of size where you go like, whoa, actually, there's there's quite a sizable blob of stuff there. Um, but also quite a difficult area to find. It's not near any of the main stars. Mm. And so it's, it's kind of like you've got to hop around and, and have a little search for it. Um, and then so there's anyone lot- that's not still stuck in the 19th century can just use their go-to. They can, but that's <laughs> but, but you know what? That's boring. <laughs> Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, as someone with a go-to, it is a dying art being able to navigate the sky. Um, let it go, people. Let it go. <laughs> There's a really nice glob. There's a really nice globula. Um, that was nice. Uh, some nice open clusters. Some nice double stars. Um, it just really nice, nice little session hopping around on a summer's evening. It was really nice. I like a double star. I uh, feel like double stars are underrated. They are. They are. There, there is. There are some. Um, well, our friend Eric Ems, he's a big, um, big double star man. Mm. Yeah. Cool. So, what have you guys been up to? Well, um, everything's really been gearing up for Astro Camp, which is this. Res- this is released. We're just twenty-one days away, ah! so that's the twenty-first to the twenty-fourth of September wow. in um, in Cumdy, where it always is. Yep. Um, there's still tickets available if anybody wants to come and stargaze with us for. Um, Three nights for what is it? Uh, Forty-five pounds. That doesn't sound too bad, does That's it? A bargain at half the price, and you get to meet your favourite podcasters. Exactly, all four of us, five of us. How many of us are there? Three, three hosts, and John and Damien, and yeah, yep. a gimp and a yeah, and a Yorkshireman <laughs> and a Frenchman. Um, or is hold on, which one's the gimp? I say a gimp and a Yorkshireman. <laughs> I, he's from Devon. He's clearly a gimp. <laughs> Right, should we move on to the emails? I think we probably should. So, um, our good friend Dave Noble um, got in touch with us, uh, saying, "Greetings from Connecticut, USA." Oh, can I just say, I love, I love the name Connecticut. There is something. I like the fact that it's got a sil- silent C in it. I, I love it. it. It's just one of those names. You know those names, and you hear a name of a place around the world, and you think that's a cool sounding place. I like that. Yeah. That, that, I've always loved the word Connecticut, like Saskatchewan. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Saskatchewan and yeah, 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 mm. exactly. Connecticut. It's just, it's, it's just a nice, yeah. Mm. It's probably a shit hole, but oh, it's nice. It's really nice. <laughs> it's really nice. I've never been. Yeah, it's one of the New England states. Very ah, nice. yeah, New England's lovely. Mm. Cool. Uh, so Dave says, I enjoy the show and the two episode format. Double the pleasure, double the fun. And and for Paul, it's double the penetration too with Ooh. two episodes. Uh, <laughs> <Hey>. a month. <laughs> I love being. Double Dave English. says. <laughs> Dave says I was playing around with Starry Night 7 exploring the upcoming solar eclipse in April 2024 never too early to plan ahead uh, to determine what bright objects might become visible during totality I was surprised by seeing Venus and Mercury during the 2017 solar eclipse and I wanted to be better prepared for the next time wow that really is planning ahead that is really mm, yeah. commendable mm. um, for 2024 all the planets will be in the sky overhead a wide-angle Ooh. photograph might be able to catch them all in the same frame. It's about 70 degrees from Uranus to Mars, 
all the planets, sorry Pluto, including the Earth in the foreground, plus the Moon and the Sun, all in one frame. No mosaic stitching required. A single exposure. I wonder if this opportunity has presented itself before, at least during the age of photography. That's an interesting question. That will probably take quite a bit of research on, on some planetarium is. software. But what an opportunity, eh? Thanks for that pointing that insane. one out. I love that. Uh, that one, I'm already thinking I'm booking a flight. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Just just to see it. That's, I, mean, I yeah. don't think I can sketch that quickly. Um, <laughs> but wow, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? To just look around and go, there it is, the entire solar system. Yeah. And with In a wide angle, photo. you can capture everything. That would, uh, yeah. That's very cool. I wonder if that has happened before. It must have. It must have. It, it, it's got to have happened before. It's just when, how long it's ago, isn't in it? In the last sort of hundred and sort mm. of sixty years or so. Well, I suppose the last mm. hundred years of, of proper photography. I suppose. Um, I wonder. Well, I don't know. Does anybody out there know? Yeah, let us yeah, know. Yeah, let us know if you do know. Yeah, fascinating. Cool. Right. It's time for the news. So, this month, we're starting off with Jen, and... Um, hello. Hello. What have you got for us? Well, seeing as Ralph is choosing to run with a theme this month, I'm going to attempt to do a very quick roundup of some of the other stories that have graced the annals of cool astronomy sh- this Ooh. month. But, because it's me, it's not going to be very quick, even if I try. <laughs> uh, so, I'm just not even going to pretend. So... Get into your comfy chair, make sure that tea is hot, and off we go. Yeah, I'm going for a Strap beer. Strap yourself See you people, it's going to be a ride. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's good, though. It's lots of different things, though. I'm not really dwelling on one thing. Like, five stories. Look, just a question. The nearest pub to my house is, like, a 10-minute walk. Yeah. Have I got time? Uh, no, but if you can get them to deliver you a pint, you're probably all right. <laughs> Were you listening to his intro, Jen? Oh, actually, that's true. It's pot calling the kettle black here, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I, hey, I didn't say I wasn't stupid. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Right. To begin with, it looks like we know a lot less about the universe than we thought we did. I mean, we already don't know a lot about the universe, mm-hmm. right? Normal matter, the stuff that makes up the things that we can see and interact with, like people, animals, stars, galaxies, all that sort of stuff, makes up less than 5% of the universe. 5%. That's it. Beyond that, about 27% of the universe is made of dark matter. Stuff that we know exists, and we do know it exists, Paul, because of its gravitational influence. Don't start! (laughs) Don't start! Stuff that we know exists because of its gravitational influence on material made of normal matter. But it doesn't seem to interact with light at all, so we don't really know what it's made of. Then the other 68% is made of dark energy, which we think is some kind of force, and we know it exists because it affects the expansion of the universe. But that's literally it. We know nothing else about it. So if you want to annoy an astronomer, you ask them about dark matter, and if you want them to bugger off, ask them about dark energy. To try and get to the bottom of dark energy, scientists have been running an experiment in an underground lab in London. It's a joint effort between Imperial College London and the University of Nottingham, and the experiment was designed to test the theory that dark energy is weaker when surrounded by matter and stronger in a vacuum, explaining why dark energy doesn't seem to rip apart planets or people, but it can cause the space between stuff to expand. In a way, dark energy would behave in an opposite way to gravity. However, unfortunately, the experiment came up empty-handed, The researchers place a metal ball and a single atom in a vacuum. And if dark energy was there, they would have expected the atom to have been displaced slightly as it got closer to the ball. But this effect wasn't seen. So, the results have ruled out a bunch of theories to explain dark energy. Looks like it's back to the drawing board to figure out what most of the universe is made of. Let's just call it the big pushy force. Yeah. And just, just, like, put it in a box and... Just, just wait for a hundred years until stick someone on a shelf else can figure it out. There's yeah, a big pushy force. That's it. It Top does. Down. It does. Shit. Makes the universe <laughs> do stuff. We know it's yeah. there. We're giving up for a while. Next up, 
we're going back into the 5% universe and the discovery of eight new repeating fast radio burst sources. Ooh! Yeah, very exciting. Now, a fast radio burst, otherwise known as an FRB, is, well, again, something that we don't know a lot about. They're short bursts of intense radio emission that last just fractions of a second and they have the characteristic sweep of a pulsar beam. So you know when you see like images of pulsars, they have that like lighthouse beam of energy Mm -mm. sort of swirling around. Yeah, that sort of thing. Now, a leading theory is that some FRBs are produced by magnetars, which are pulsars with huge magnetic fields, but it can't explain all of them. And the amount of energy released in an FRB in this short time period of just a fraction of a second is astounding. It can be as much as the radiation from 500 million suns. Just a bit then. Just a bit. And it seems incredible that that amount of energy could come from just one star. Mm. Which is why they're a bit of a mystery. Now, the first FRB was discovered in 2007 and the first repeating one in 2012. And up until this announcement, it was only that one and then one other repeater that was known about. But now we know about 10. Mm. And that's really important because now astronomers can figure out when the next burst is due to happen and plan appropriate observations to collect as much data as possible. And then hopefully get to the bottom of these mysterious objects peppering the radio sky. Oh, I, can I just put forward magnetar as the coolest name in astronomy? It's good. It's a good word, isn't it? It's a it's good, good word. word isn't it's it? like a. I could imagine like a James Bond villain creating oh, yeah, yeah. some or, sort of evil laser or, or machine. It's a, yeah. Or it's a Marvel Calling character, it a isn't it? It's a Marvel character. Yeah. 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 Magnetar. Yeah. It's magnetar. Good. Supernova <laughs> was the coolest one before Oasis made it popular and commonplace. Uh, Which one? Don't mention Supernova. that word. Hmm. Right. You might as well say Chaz and Dave. <laughs> <laughs> the Northern Chaz and Dave. They're the Northern Chaz and Dave. <laughs> that would mean nothing to anyone outside of probably London. They make they make dire straits look avant garde. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Can I carry on? Because I got a lot to get through, and you just keep interrupting. Could you just do a few of new stories, Jen? No. No. Oh, okay. Basically. Yeah. Crack on! <laughs> next, on our journey through the cosmos, we're landing with a bang at our next target, a galaxy almost a billion light years away from Earth, and one of the most unusual and violent explosions ever seen. First observed in 2016 by Gaia, this isolated supernova explosion is like nothing ever seen before. Lying some 54,000 light years away from its host galaxy, follow up observations from many telescopes have shown that this supernova is unusual in almost every way. The host star seems to have been around 200 times the mass of the Sun, and there's wow. just a handful of stars approaching such masses in our own galaxy, and they exist in huge clusters instead of in isolation like this star. The star would have lived for just a few million years before exploding. And before its death, astronomers think it ejected matter at a prolific rate, a few solar masses per year for about 10 years, losing, in total, about 85% of its mass. And then when it eventually did collapse, it did so so violently that it left no remnant behind. Get out of town. It's amazing, isn't it? Like nothing. Nothing. Diddly squat. It didn't, like, not even a black hole or anything. It just it just went. Nothing. Literally everything annihilated because Whoa. they think it collapsed as a peer instability supernova. And what Ooh. that means is that the collapsing core produces gamma rays and those gamma rays produce particles and antiparticles, Whoa. which means that it literally annihilates itself into nothing. Whoa. Oh man, that's, that's more cool than a magnetar. That, 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 it needs a cool name though. Yeah, it does. It does. Right, we'll put it out to the listeners. We need a cool name for a pair yeah. instability supernova. Something cooler than magnetar. Yeah, something that annihilates itself. It is so big. That's, it doesn't yeah. even leave a black hole. That's nothing. That's sci-fi. That's amazing. It's cool, right? That's very cool. Could we have got this wrong? Well, or do we know this for a fact that this is what it, happens? Not necessarily in this is, case, but that that is what happens. 
this is the only thing that they think it could be because so evidence of this sort of explosion has never before been seen but all the evidence points to it being this pair instability supernova um wow. it's a combination of there's a lack of metals and for astronomers metals is uh, anything heavier than hydrogen and helium that's what astronomers call metals and mm-hmm. um, there's a severe lack of those which would allow the star to get to the sort of mass that it did like the 200 solar masses another thing is that um it's going to be glowing for years now normally supernovae they only glow for months yeah 100 days typically is the yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um it has a very peculiar light curve because it's sort of you had the the initial sort of supernova but then you're getting this extra burst of light mm. and what that is is all the material they're expelled it's all of that material glowing Wow. from all the radiation from the explosion but because there's so much material it's going to be glowing for years and years as this energy kind of ripples through the stuff that was ejected so it's a combination of the light curve the lack of the heavy elements um the duration all these kind of things the fact that it's like in isolation way way um outside of its host galaxy the fact that it's in a dwarf galaxy all these things point to a pair instability supernova and the fact that there's no remnant, there's no evidence of a black hole, there's no evidence of a pulsar in the centre. There's just nothing there. Um, it's the first time one's been observed and the data is matching the theory of what they thought would be there for a pair instability supernova. Um, so yeah, the, the, this it's basically a scenario of this is the only thing that we have that can explain it. So unless someone else can come up with some other mm-hmm. like crazy theory that can explain all of these observations, it seems that it is the first time that we've seen evidence of a pair instability supernova. Um, and because it's the first time, you know, it's a massive step forward um, in the field and it's going to be studied for years and years to come. Um, and so the understanding of this object is only going to grow and grow. But the best bit about this work is that it was actually led by a graduate student instead of, you know, some old fuddy-duddy professor. It's someone like me sort of doing their PhD. Uh, So congratulations to them. It's a fab bit of work. And their name was? Oh, and their name was Sebastian Gomez. So well done you. Fantastic. So... We're going back into the solar system now, so we're slowly getting closer. Oh, home. God, is there still more? She's got, There's more! She's got, you looked at this script, she's got two more to go. Oh, f- yeah. oh Come on. man. Like, like, seriously. We're going back. Seriously, I'm going for a beer now. You're on your own for five minutes. <laughs> All right. We're going back into the solar system, and astronomers believe they have an explanation for the late accretion phase of the formation of the solar system. The period of late accretion refers to the intense bombardment of the terrestrial planets, so that's Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, by comets and planetesimals and asteroids shortly after their formation. Models of giant planet migration have revealed that such a bombardment can be triggered by their movement and last for about 30 million years or so. And measurements of the ages of the older surfaces on the Earth and the Moon using the radioactive decay of different isotopes combined then with the age of the oldest features on Mercury and Mars means that the bombardment caused by the motion of the giant planets must have occurred at least 4.48 billion years ago. And Mm. this means that prebiotic chemistry could have existed in small pockets on the Earth just 80 million years after the beginning of the bombardment. Oh. Yeah, which is in agreement with other studies that have examined the timeline for the Mm. earliest emergence of life on Earth, which is about 170 million years after the solar system finished forming. Mm. Because there's been this big hoo-ha for a long time about, like, when did this late bombardment happen? Um, Would it have annihilated any early emergence of life on Earth? And this study seems to show, nope, it's fine wouldn't have done any damage. Mm. And of course, that has more implications as well for other planets too. Yes, exactly. And that we know sort of we're more hospitable earlier on. Yeah. And then who knows, maybe it was kind of all the comets and everything hitting the Earth at that stage, which actually kind of kicked off all the prebiotic chemistry. Yeah, yeah. Don't know. But final story, because Ralph is about to set the phases to kill because of how long I've uh, been doing the news. I'm I'm back, I'm back. I'm back for the finale. 
back for the finale. Oh, you missed the good stuff, Paul. Did I? Yeah. Did I? Do you know what? You're going to be impressed. Budweiser. Oh, good man. Yeah, I know. Someone, someone gave me a box of cooking lager. I thought I should break into it. You're on Budweiser. <laughs> I'm on Bud Light. What are you on, Jen? I'm on a can of Coke. Oh. Yeah, I got back into work tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, mm. Yeah. I'm on the white beer if anybody's interested. Ooh. Mm. So, we're finishing up with our feet very firmly on the ground, or at least ice, as we crash land into Antarctica with the discovery of interstellar radioactive iron in the snow. Whoa. Awesome! Produced by the violent deaths of stars in supernova explosions, it pervades the interstellar medium or the stuff between the stars as dust. But where did this iron come from? Now, it's unlikely that we'll ever be able to pin down exactly where, you know, a particular supernova or something. But 40,000 years ago, the solar system started to drift through the local interstellar cloud, which is also known as the local fluff. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> yep. And so this is a good culprit. Um, this is just a big cloud of gas and dust, um, which is just in our solar neighbourhood. Um, it's a good culprit because the source of the iron has got to be nearby to account for its quantity. If it was far away, the iron would have just been dispersed into space and there wouldn't be enough to account for the amount that's been detected. Also, the snow that was analysed is less than 20 years old. If they can find ice, which is older than 40,000 years old, that doesn't have this radioactive iron, mm. then that would confirm the theories about our motion around the galaxy. Ooh, like that. Yeah. Don't I'm they... done, Ralph. Woo! God, that's a good one to finish with. I like that. I, I, yeah. Do you know what? She went on for a while, but there were some bloody cool stories in there. There was. Yeah. There was. There was. I'll, I'll let her off, because mm. that, yeah. that, was, that was good stuff. Local mm. fluff. Local fluff. It's not even April. That can't be an April Fool's. No. Nope. nope. Sometimes astronomers name things well. Most of the time they don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Rafe, old boy, what have you got for us? Well, as Jen suggests, I'm going to be running with the theme this month and I'm going all exoplanetary with three stories of other worlds and the hints that we can now get into them from space telescopes, ground telescopes and scientific modelling. Uh, first up is a glimpse at the future of exoplanet searches in the age of ESO's Extremely Large Telescope and NASA's James Webb Space Telescope next decade. Now, um, we, because of uh, Kepler and a range of other uh, telescopes uh, that haven't been anywhere near as prolific as Kepler, we now know that there's loads of exoplanets of all sizes, all shapes, all different kind of solar systems that exist. We have a good handle on the distances to different exoplanets and we have uh, candidates to look more deeply into when the capabilities come online to be able to do that. We know which ones are nearby, which ones are kind of Earth and rocky sized, which ones are in the habitable zone. This is a kind of a sample of what we've seen so far. There's obviously uh, exponentially more of these. We know that um, from what Kepler's told us that pretty much every star has at least one on average planet around it and most of them have many. Um, now, as the Spitzer Space Telescope has less resolution than these new telescopes that are being built, um, it stared for 100 hours at an interesting candidate 48 light years away. Interesting because it's just a little larger than Earth and orbiting in the habitable zone of a red dwarf star system, so a good candidate for habitability mm. or life. And in this observation, it was found to be made of basaltic rock like the Moon or Mercury but unlikely to have an atmosphere, which was likely to have been stripped away from the planet by its host star, suggesting that it also has no magnetic field either. These are, of course, inferences we get from its infrared signature, but it does show what we can glean from... Li yeah, what? They've managed to figure out that it's made of basaltic rock. Yes, they have, just from its heat signature. Just they've been from able its to, heat signature. They've been able to tell that it's it doesn't have an atmosphere... Uh, because of the signature that it's got from it. And because um, it's very dark, which you can tell from the heat signature, it's um, the chances are that it's basaltic rock, which is dark rock. That is brilliant. 
I know, and that's. Aww. But it does take a lot of staring out there with these massive infrared telescopes. Whereas when we've got um, the extremely large telescope and we've got James Webb uh, next decade and the decade after, we're going to be able to just zap these um, all these candidates in a night and just know what their signatures are like in much better detail, and also be able to tell what's in those atmospheres. And what we're particularly looking for is those biomarkers, those signatures of life in there. But this gives us a glimpse. This is kind of you know doing the long, laborious work with the technology that we've got now but in 10 years time you know we're going to be able to do this in a night i i am loving this news so far today guys mm-hmm. I, I i am i am having a continuous stream of sex way through this <laughs> <laughs> in science brilliant it's brilliant it's stars <laughs> oh look at the stars oh isn't they lovely and they're lovely so next from me, we have the discovery of more planets in a neighbouring star system that gives us hope for finding these biosignatures. This is an M dwarf star called GJ1061. Snappy. And it's it's a beautiful name. They, they, they just give them such lovely names, don't they? Yeah. Um, we now know that this has at least three rocky planets orbiting close in. Wow. Now, M dwarf stars are much cooler than our sun, so planets need to be closer in to get enough heat to be in the habitable zone. But M dwarves are also more turbulent, so can randomly spit radiation onto these close planets. So hoping for life to form and flourish in these systems is something of a double-edged sword. Mm. Um, But what we we do know about these planets... We actually talked about that, was it last episode or the episode before? Uh, Yeah, it was a couple of episodes ago, wasn't it? Yeah, about that that very idea that actually all these these, um, close-in planets to small stars actually probably are buggered because... Yeah, it's actually not a stable place to be. Yeah, mm. they just keep getting bathed in radiation because yeah. they're so close to their stars, and that's how close they need to be to get the amount of energy mm. Mm. for for water to exist on the surface, or or for that's water right. to exist in three states. Um, but what we know about these three worlds is that they're all between one point four and one times uh, the mass of Earth, so kind of Earth comparable. And they complete an orbit between 3 and 13 days. So they are really whipping around More this star. That, that's close. Yeah. And, and the innermost um, is therefore all but ruled out. But the outer planet is in the traditional habitable zone. It's it's uh, at the right distance for water to exist on that planet mm-hmm. if the conditions are right there. So it's definitely going to go on the list for James Webb and the Extremely Large Telescope, see if it's retained an atmosphere um, or or whether it has liquid water and ideally if it has chemical markers associated with life in uh, in that atmosphere, if it does exist. Now, um, finally from me is more of how we use what we already know about atmospheric, oceanographic and planetary science to help us know what worlds to look for in that search for life or conditions optimised for life in the cosmos. We know four moons in the solar system have oceans. Mm -hmm. We suspect another few may have. We think half a dozen exoplanets have a surface ocean. We know Mars and Venus had oceans in their past, and Earth, of course, has oceans covering more than 70% of its surface. We know here on Earth, we know that the upwelling of water from the Earth's ocean floor draws nutrients up to the surface, meaning that more upwelling equals more biodiversity because that leads to more uh, life flourishing because there's more nutrients for it to feed on. So researchers at the University of Chicago use this to suggest that our search for life in the universe shouldn't necessarily be focused on habitable zone planets because not all oceans are equally hospitable. And some oceans will be better places to live than others due to their global circulation patterns. So Dr. Stephanie Olson of the University of Chicago modelled the known properties of discovered exoplanets to highlight those that have the best prospects of nourishment emerging and flourishing life forms. She says, We found that higher atmospheric density, slower rotation rates and the presence of continents all yield higher upwelling rates. A further implication is that Earth might not actually be optimally habitable and life elsewhere may enjoy a planet that's even more hospitable than our own, which kind of flips everything on its head because we're always looking for something Uh, like our own, thinking that life is going to be harder to start elsewhere. And it may actually, if the conditions are more suitable... 
there may and, be better chances of seeing finding life and wider biodiversity out there. And here's that pendulum again, isn't it? We we go mm. through periods where people go, oh, actually, it's all buggered. There's no there's no way life can be on planets. They're all bathed yeah. in radiation. Yeah. Blah, blah blah blah. Nothing like. And then it swings back the other way and go, actually, no, it's it's no life's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, fascinating stuff. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. The thing is, we just really don't have a handle on it at the minute. No, no, no because we've we're only working on you know an example of one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A sample size of one. Yeah. Give it, you know, give it twenty years, and this, the you know, the the answers in these fields, the the the, the answers in this field will be so much. Oh my balls <laughs> and arse! <laughs> and you're on cola. I know. Uh, give it, you know, another twenty years, and the sort of answers that we have uh, for questions in this field, they'll be so radically different. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we'll know one way or the other in twenty years. Yeah, well, as you mentioned earlier, once these these mega telescopes, skele- once these <laughs> mega telescopes come online, um, and can actually do much more of this sort of peering into the atmospheres of a planet, we are going to get a much better handle on on what is actually possible and what these planets yeah. are like and things. It's, it's going to yeah. be, as you said, it's a, so there's a golden age about to open up in this. Yeah, and it's going to be fascinating. So um, our big story just sort of for discussion because it was it was so uh, fascinating is jupiter um and this is juno data um, that has revealed something rather odd about the planet um which a, a explanation has been put forward um which leads on to all sorts of other discussions about the solar system and and some of the sort of issues and problems of the formation of the solar system mm-hmm. and that's what juno's discovered um, well, who wants to? Who wants to? Does anyone want to describe what Juno's discovered? Well, should we talk about Juno a little bit first? Mm, go for it. In case people have forgotten. Go for it. So Juno was uh, arrived at Jupiter a few years ago now, um, and the goal of the probe is to basically try and figure out the origin and also the evolution of Jupiter. So basically, how the Jupiter that we see today got there. Mm. Um, it's gone there to try and measure how much water there is in the atmosphere because this affects planet formation theories, which, of course, you know, like with Ralph's news stories, you know how much of a hot topic exoplanets are at the minute. So that directly impacts them. Um, we don't really have any idea about how deep Jupiter's atmosphere is and how it changes sort of below mm. what we can see sort of on in the very upper atmosphere. So it's gone out there to look at that. Um it's there to measure the magnetic field, um, also the gravitational field of Jupiter, um, try and figure out if there is metallic hydrogen deep beneath the surface, um, the surface atmosphere, because that's what they think is generating this huge magnetic field um, of Jupiter, but it's yet to be confirmed, so it's gone there to try and figure out if that is the case. Um, and it's also there to study the magnetosphere near the poles in particular, to have a look at the aurorae, to see if it can um, figure out if they are causing like the same processes on Earth, if the process is different. Because mm. um, cause Juno's in this um, sort of extended polar orbit, isn't it? It's it's actually the yeah that that's the whereas other probes have, have done the equatorial stuff. This this probe's actually been in this very long eccentric um, orbit that goes over the poles. Yeah, because it kind of swings in and then goes away again and. Mm swings in and it, and it kind of orbits like that uh, but it's also there as well to try and figure out how deep the belts and the zones are do mm. they do they extend you know very far into the atmosphere are they a surface feature um you know all, all those sorts of things so those those are its goals anyway and so uh, what we've what we've seen is um well juno's revealed something very unexpected about the core of the planet hasn't it um, yes and this this has led to this this sort of hypothesis about what might have occurred, because what it's revealed is that um, up until Juno, we we always assumed that there was a very sort of clear delineation between the sort of atmosphere, the gaseous planet, and the core. That there would be this then sort of more solid, more sort of liquidy, solid, metallic core to the yeah. planet, um, yeah. and and that it would it would have a pretty defined sort of change um i mean yeah you look at all the sort of diagrams mm. of the the gas giants you know particularly jupiter and it's literally 
here's a rocky core, there's some metallic hydrogen, the rest of it's gas. And then, yeah, and then there's a sort of clear boundary, boom, it's yeah. gas. Like and you could, you know, literally take take the core out and it would look like a rocky planet. Exactly. Um, and actually, this turns out not to be the case because what Juno has discovered is that it appears to have a very fuzzy core, that it's not um, as kind of compact and as dense as they expected. Um, it's very weird. Yeah. So it was it, it expected that, you know, you have this compact, as Jane said, this sort of compact solid core, the, the metallic hydrogen and so on. But actually, it seems to be this very fuzzy not as compact core that is leaking out into the atmosphere. And, that and leaking out a good way as well. Yeah, and it's, it's not actually a, uh, a, a nice transition. There is, you can't actually define a sort of a, a, a transition area. It's just this core, this fuzzy core that's bleeding, is the description, out into nearly half the planet's radius. That's a substantial way. It's a substantial way. So you imagine slicing Jupiter in half. You know, half that radius from the core... Is this fuzzy core. Is this fuzzy core that's bleeding out into the atmosphere. Um, which, of course, then opens up all sorts of questions about, you know, sort of why why is Jupiter so, in many ways, radically... Well, certainly visually, but radically different from Saturn. Mass. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> and rotation. But why? Why is that? Why are what? Because it's heavier. Because everything's more turbulent. Because it's all mental in the middle of Jupiter. Well, exactly, in, exactly. In forming its atmosphere too, which feeds into this fuzziness, I guess. Exactly, which is why you know why are two planets that normally are are made of the same stuff and formed in the you know, roughly the same you know the same area of the solar system, you know, but as the theory goes, so they they should be similar. Mm. Why is Jupiter? so visually different why is it so violent why are all these, these sort of very bright visual storms on it whereas Saturn although we know it's, it is turbulent doesn't seem quite as extreme Deja vu I'm going to say it again it's more massive because yeah. <laughs> it's you, you look at brown dwarf stars and they've got this kind of effect on them you know they've got these these. Uh, you, we saw it in the infrared images mm. years ago when we first started seeing these brown dwarf stars that we noticed that they've got these swirling patterns around them yeah. so it's quite clear that in this mass between um, a gas giant of say uh, Saturn's mass all the way up to a brown dwarf before it becomes a, a main sequence star you've got uh, you've got these the mass causes this churning and this, or these, uh, if it's low enough mass, the, the the winds in the atmosphere, and if it's a higher mass, it's just this churning that goes on that's visible in this kind of failed star. Yeah, but what what this what this Juno data is pointing out is that the core of Jupiter isn't as expected, and actually it's not to do with its mass. And what's been put forward is that it's to do with a massive collision. It's its mass. <laughs> it, this is the hill that Ralph is going to die on. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll go quiet again now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, some astronomers... What's this theory then? <laughs> so the astronomers um, yeah, in, in the University of China have put this forward, that why how you could explain this, this fuzzy bleeding core is if the early Jupiter, the young sort of proto-Jupiter, was in a, a head-on collision with a large protoplanet, probably about the size of Uranus. And that by modelling this, they show that, that that kind of impact and the disruption it caused would continue for four and a half billion years, would, would stay as it is. So Jupiter was basically stirred up and violently punched four and a half billion years mm. ago which has left it with this messed up core, which is bleeding out and is potentially sort of causing the, the sort of disruption in its atmosphere and, and making it the planet we see today. So that timeline also fits with that story that I talked about in my news mm. about the when the heavy bombardment happened and it you know coincided with the motion of these, the sort of orbit swapping of the outer gas giants. Mm. It's yeah. not a dissimilar time period. No, exactly, and this is this leads on to all sorts of other um, questions because it, 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 there's a picture building of the early solar system being a very different place to how we view it now, 
Um, and we've got these questions about Planet Nine. Yeah. Um, and we've got the the hypothesis that um, there was another large planet about the size of Neptune that must have been flung out of the solar system for the current stability to exist as it does, that, that there needed to be a planet flung out. Um, we've got Venus as a, as a body that's clearly been flipped over. Uranus, a planet that's been flipped onto its side. Yep. There is all sorts going on in the solar system and all these, these measurements are, are, are sort of adding to this idea that the, the early solar system was like a pinball game. Yeah. And that there were various planets and protoplanets whizzing around and bumping into each other and doing all sorts of things. But it, it does lead on to this. You know, people searching for Planet Nine and is it one of these things that was flung out? Is it one of these bodies? You know, Is this the body that smacked into Jupiter and knocked Uranus, whatever? Has it been flung out to the sort of distant realms of the solar system? Or is it a unique body in itself? There's all sorts going on here. But this was a fascinating story because it, it has completely changed how we view the, the sort of makeup of Jupiter. It's, you know, all those diagrams in all the textbooks up until now are basically wrong. Yep. They, they just, just not, out again. It's just not what Jupiter looks like at all. Should have thrown out your books when they demoted Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't, you better do it now. Um, and it's an and, and interesting um, statement. There's one of the... the uh, co-authors on the paper um, Andrea Isella when she first heard of the, the sort of hypothesis that was put to her by uh, an astronomer called Shang Fei, he said it sounded very unlikely to me, um, it said it's like a one in a trillion probability but she said then by the sheer amount of calculation that went into this and the modelling she realised actually this this is actually quite probable this collision mm. and that this this actually is is a very good idea of what might have happened and why Jupiter's core is this complete mess. As it's untestable, I feel quite confident saying I'm right and the University of China is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ralph, if you say so. Right, should we do a sky guide? Yes. Oh, yeah. So, like shy debutantes, summer weary astronomers are emerging ready to face the new season. So, pop on your best ball gown, get your dancing shoes on, and get that scope cooled to perfection. September is here and the sky won't wait. Jenny. Mercury reaches superior conjunction on the 3rd of this month, which means it's going to be hidden away behind our star for much of September. Even by month's end, the tiny planet will be set in about 40 minutes after the sun does, so it's safer to kind of just forget about it until <laughs> next month. Same for Venus. Superior conjunction occurred in the middle of last month. So again, forget about hunting out Earth's twin this month. It's just simply too dangerous. And again for Mars. It's that conjunction on the 2nd of September, so it's <laughs> hidden behind the sun. Sorry, it's a bit of a shit time, really, for planets. <laughs> <laughs> They're just all hiding away. <laughs> but if you do have a slightly larger telescope, you might want to try hunting down Uranus and Neptune. Uranus is heading towards opposition in October and Neptune achieves it on the 10th of this month. Neptune doesn't get very high in the sky, only about 32 degrees above the southeastern horizon at about 2 o'clock in the morning, but it is high enough for you to be able to at least give it a go. Neptune will start off in Leo this month and then it'll head towards Virgo as the month progresses. On the 14th, it'll lie almost exactly on a line drawn between Beta and Nu Virgo and slightly closer to Beta Virgo. By month's end, Neptune will be very close to Spica in Virgo. And on the 27th, it'll be almost exactly on a line drawn between Spica and Theta Virgo, slightly closer to Spica. And on the 29th, it'll make its closest approach to Spica. Look out for a green-blue disc. Unfortunately, unless you have a mammoth scope, you'll probably not be able to pick up Triton because the moon shines below magnitude 13. Neptune itself will be around magnitude 8 and we'll get stuck into Uranus next month. Ralph. 
Well, you might have been wondering why Jenny's gone through all the planets and not mentioned Jupiter and Saturn, and that's where you get to peer behind the curtain at the good ship awesome, and that's because if you write your sky guide out first, you get your first dibs. So <laughs> it might not this be a surprise true. that I'm doing Jupiter and Saturn. <laughs> this is what I get for like doing it last. I'm like, oh, okay, Ralph's covered Jupiter and Saturn. I'll see what else there is, and there is... <laughs> All. When we say last, we mean the afternoon before recording. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's been some scripting going on in the last two hours, I think. <laughs> yes. So perhaps the biggest and brightest objects on offer this month are, unsurprisingly, the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn. And while they're low in the sky now, neither of them actually get above 16 degrees above the horizon, um, anyone with a low southern horizon will get their best planetary kicks with this pair still. Uh, both planets will already be hanging in the southern sky by the time darkness falls and your window for viewing will only be a few hours as you find that right balance between darkness and altitude. But they'll put on a great naked eye display dominating the southern sky and a pair of binoculars will show the rings around Saturn as a bulge and Jupiter's four Galilean moons. A small or medium-sized telescope will show some cloud patterns on Jupiter, but the thick, soupy atmosphere near the horizon will make this pretty hazy, but Saturn's rings will still pop out. Seeing the ever-changing configurations of Jupiter's moon from hour to hour and night to night is a nice way to see the orbital dance of Io, Europa, Callisto and Ganymede. The moon will gatecrash Jupiter's space with a Jupiter-moon conjunction on the 5th and 6th of September, and then Saturn on the 8th. Then we have two nighttime meteor showers in September. We have the Aurigids peaking on the 1st of September and the September Epsilon Perseids peaking on the 9th. For both the Aurigids and the Epsilon Perseids, you'll want to be facing northeast, and the later in the night, the more chance you'll have of seeing them. And I'll manage expectations now. Neither are prolific, with around one every 10 minutes in ideal conditions. But with warm evenings and some particularly bright meteors from the Aurigids, you might get some nice fireworks to complement your well-earned gin and tonic. And actually, oh, I like a gin. We we've had <laughs> at camp when we when camps coincided with the the Epsilon Perseids, we've actually had a really good display sometimes. That's true, we have. Mm. Um, so, if, I mean, if you're in dark skies, you won't fail to miss them mm. um, if, you're, if you're looking up or if you're um, observing anyway. Um, in fact, last night, just out of the corner of my eye uh, from central Sidonia, um, I saw probably the brightest uh, meteor I've seen flash across the sky. In, wow. And, and that's probably a testament to what Paul was saying earlier about the clarity of the skies oh, uh, last night. I saw some great meteors last night. There was, there was a cracker about 11 o'clock, really bright shot straight straight across southern sky it was beautiful oh maybe you were both looking at the same one oh i wonder oh in that cute mm. right then i was thinking of paul at the time uh yeah yeah you were naked very hard mm. <laughs> i was thinking very hard i mean mm. <laughs> and i was looking at uranus right <laughs> september offers up many fantastic objects but let's have a closer look at M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. So, planetary nebula Messier 27, the Dumbbell, the Apple Core, or NGC 6853, was first discovered, unsurprisingly, by Charles Messier in 1764. Despite not being the closest planetary nebula at 1,227 light years away, it is big and bright, and it can be found in binoculars. It's magnitude 7.5, and it's eight arc minutes across. Um, it's over a light year across and expanding at 31 kilometres a second, which gives it an estimated age of 9,800 years. The central star is thought to be one of the largest white dwarfs known with a radius of 0.055 that of the sun, or 0.13 light seconds, which is quite cool. And mm. it's got a mass of 0.56 that of the sun. The star has a surface temperature of 85,000 Kelvin and is believed Ooh. to have a companion star, a magnitude 17 yellow star that's separated by 6.6 .6 arc seconds. 85,000 Kelvin. Yeah. That it's got a companion. Mm. Yeah, it's cool, that's isn't it? It's sort of survived. Yeah, it's, it's just, that's, I think that's one of the coolest facts about M27 is when you're looking at that, there's, yeah. there's, that, there's a really big and very, very hot white dwarf in there. I wonder if it's vampiric. But it's actually, yeah, it's actually got this this other little... It's got a little buddy with it. Yeah, well, that's really... what surprises me. Yeah, it's very cool. It's very cool. 
it might be part of the reason the um, the dumbbell is the shape that it is. So where to find the dumbbell? So the first thing to do is find the summer triangle, um, which of course is Deneb, the back of Cygnus, Altair and Aquila, and of course Vega up in Lyra. And then if you look between Deneb and Altair and you work your way down the line, about two thirds of the way around from Deneb, you will find one of those constellations that's often overlooked, but is actually something that it, it looks like what it says it is, which is Sagittar, the arrow. And it is a line of stars with a little group of feathers at the end. Um, so it's pointing um, to the left. Um, so you take the front star, 12 Sagittar, and then you work up just, just over two degrees back towards Deneb, you should not fail to see M27, even in your finder scope. It's visible in binoculars, um, and you will see it as a little tiny fuzzy ball, um, even in your finder scope. And you've got your scope on that, and you should be hopefully completely blown away with a very spectacular planetary nebula, which is one of the larger ones, in a really spectacular star field, because of course this is where the Milky Way is running through the sky. So it's a very busy part of the sky, um, so it's a really great planetary nebula in a really great setting. I love M27. It's one of my favourite objects. It is. It's just something that you can always go back to and never fail to be amazed by it. Mm. it There's is. so much That's... detail that you can see. Yeah. I, I, and imaging it as well. You get, you know, if you're just beginning imaging, it's a great thing to start with mm. because there are like you can very easily sort of get the red and the, the blue-green colours. And then, you know, as you get more proficient at imaging and you get better and better and then you can start teasing out all the details sort of actually in the nebulae. Mm. So, it's time to go deeper. Jenny. This month, I refuse to be bound by shackles and I cast aside the bonds of deep sky. <laughs> this month, I'm suggesting you try and find the zodiacal light at the start of September. The moon, yeah, because the moon is not going to be about in the pre-dawn sky for the first couple of weeks of the coming month, which means that the sky is going to be nice and dark, giving you the best opportunity to spy this elusive phenomenon. Mm. To see the zodiacal lights, you will need to be in truly dark skies. Turn your attention to the eastern horizon in the pre-dawn sky and look for a triangle-shaped glow fainter than the Milky Way. It's sometimes confused with the early dawn light, so make sure you check your local sunrise times so you can be sure that you're seeing the zodiacal light. And that diffuse glow, that triangle of light, of kind of whitish light that you see, is caused by sunlight reflected off dust particles between the planets along the plane of the solar system. Which I think is pretty damn cool, really, because dust is the best. <laughs> That and is as a little bit of trivia, it's also the subject of Brian May's PhD. It is. It is. Ralph, take me deeper. Okay, much, much deeper. Uh, as Cepheus is almost directly overhead this month, I'll give you some suggestions for a bit of a tour of that constellation, which is a faint elongated pentagon or a simple house shape with a variety of objects from binary stars and open clusters to emission and dark nebulas. And I'll start with possibly one of the most important stars in the sky, Delta Cepheus. Now this star lies just outside the pentagon shape and is best located by finding the bright star on the halfway point between magnitude 3.5 Iota Cepheus and Beta Lacerte in the tip of the neighbouring Lacerta constellation. Uh, Delta Cephei gave its name to the class of stars known as Cepheid variables, stars that pulsate in brightness in a predictable pattern that allow us to determine the distance to the star by comparing its known luminosity to its observed brightness. Delta Cephei is a yellowy white star that brightens and dims by almost a full magnitude every five days. This is something Ooh, you can see cool. for yourself with the naked eye. It is, it's really cool and you can, mm. it is actually noticeable and it kind of... Um, if you're in particularly um, crappy skies, you actually notice that it's either there or it's not there on, mm. on certain nights. Mm. Mm. I, I tell you what, if it's I, once every five days, it's a good target for Astro Camp. Oh, it is, isn't it? That's a good point. Yeah. Photographically, that would really show up on yeah. the first yeah. and the last night. Yeah, camp. I'd say, I, I can convert, living in West London, I used to notice that a lot. That's nice. It's great. 
Yeah. Um, but if you um, put a, a small telescope on it, uh, you can easily split it into its binary components too, which um, oh. which often gets overlooked as a, as a binary. Mm. Love a double star. Mm-hmm. Now on to the open cluster NGC 7129 on the other side of Cepheus. This time we are two degrees inside the house shape, halfway between the stars Alferk and Alderamin. Uh, here you find an open cluster made of young stars illuminating local gas from which those stars were actually born. Um, at seven by seven arc minutes across, you should be able to see this easily enough in a medium-sized amateur scope, and astrophotographers will be able to see the bright cluster of stars and the beautiful tendrils of illuminated gas in a kind of rosebud shape that rivals the Orion Nebula for the beauty and detail you can see. Um, I'm surprised this isn't one that's that's more frequently looked at because, especially for astrophotographers, the detail in there, although it's smaller than the Orion Nebula, it really does have that same kind kind of tendrilly mm. look and, and you can see the sinews of the uh, the swirling gas that's been illuminated it's quite fantastic so finally in Cepheus I'm going to suggest perhaps the first dark nebula we've recommended in seven years of this show wow uh, I, oh I'm, I'm just wondering if we've ever covered the elephant trunk nebula which is nearby but I'm not sure we did did we because I had I <laughs> ran out of time to do the <laughs> sky <laughs> guide <laughs> And yes, you assholes wrote it for me. <laughs> and we got lots of interesting emails about that particular segment. I can't imagine why. <laughs> no, I'm not sure why either. <laughs> and you've never been late with your, script, with your Sky Guide script again, have you? <laughs> hey, I tell you what, <laughs> taught me a lesson, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> There's going to well, be people now going, oh, what are they on about if they're new listeners? Yeah, go back to the one with the elephant. Go find it. In. It's well worth it. Yeah. Uh, well, it. dark nebula get often overlooked, and and it's it's kind of not surprising really because a dark nebula is just a patch of darkness in the sky, and who wants to see something dark in the night sky? You know, we're looking for bright objects in the I night like sky. Dust. Yes, you do. You like dust, but I do. But you... Me, pick me. <laughs> 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 I do. I like dark patches. <laughs> well, this is perfect for you then, Jem, because if you look one degree inside the Pentagon from the orange supergiant Zeta CPI which is in the bottom left-hand corner of the Pentagon, you'll find a rich patch of sky a degree across known as Barnard 174. To me, it's a rival for that Elephant's Trunk Nebula. I think the dark rift running through this brighter patch of sky is more pronounced, looking like a, a split in the fa fabric of space. And what you're actually looking at is an elongated cloud of interstellar dust blotting out the background stars. You'll easily Yay. see it in a medium-sized scope at low magnification, but it makes a great astrophotography target as well. Um, and it's uh, unlike the Elephant Trunk Nebula, it's, uh, it's kind of a much longer, more pronounced dark seam that's in the middle of that uh, brighter patch of sky oh, I've never looked at that one I, it's funny if I was looking at Barnard's E last night in Aquila ah. which is a little dark nebula in Aquila um, that's in Aquila is it? yeah it is It is. Um, it's a little dark but it looks like the letter E in the sky hmm. it's really cool cool Right, to finish off, we have the moon this month, which ended August at noon. So we have first quarter on the 6th, full on the 14th, last quarter on the 22nd, and new on the 28th. So, clear skies and happy hunting. Okay, so now it's time to hand over control of the good ship awesome to you lovely people. This episode we have a question from our good friend Alistair Frith, who is at Alistair Frith on Twitter, and he asks Awesome Astronomy, been wondering, how can Titan have such a thick atmosphere with such a low gravity? Okay, who's taking this one? Because it is a great question. Can I? I love this. Yeah. It's a fab question. Go for it. So there's four key factors to whether a planet or a moon keeps its atmosphere they are the mass of the body the proximity to its star because of the stellar wind the body's magnetosphere protecting that atmosphere and the stability of the system if you've got asteroids crashing into it then that's going to have a, an impact on its atmosphere too now despite being really close to massive saturn Titan's a pretty stable system, so we can largely ignore the stability factor for now. But balancing the other three is key here. So Titan's atmosphere is really thick, 
but its mass is really low and it has no internal dynamo to create a magnetic shield. So you compare that to Mars, which has about three times the pull on its atmosphere because it's a bigger body with more mass. Yet still Mars is losing its atmosphere to the unrelenting stream of particles from the Sun. So if Titan's smaller than Mars and has no magnetosphere, why does it keep its atmosphere, as Alistair asks, while Mars is losing its? Well, put simply, it's further out in the solar system. So the solar wind is weaker in the Saturnian system than the Martian system. And secondly, perhaps more importantly for the eventual fate of Titan's atmosphere, it spends 95% of its orbit inside Saturn's extended magnetosphere, which protects it further. Mm -hmm. But we don't know whether Titan's gravity will be sufficient to hold on to its atmosphere going into the future. But the Dragonfly drone getting to Titan in 2034 should help us answer this if planetary science and space exploration missions in the meantime don't. So there's your answer. Ooh, like nice. it. And how exciting is Dragonfly? It's so cool. I know. <laughs> Drones on Titan. Well, there we have it. Back to your lives, humans. You have difference to hate and indifference to cling to like a security blanket. I hope mm. you enjoyed the distraction for a short while. Let us know what you think should be the name for a pair instability supernova, the death of a star so large that its explosion doesn't leave a trace. It has to be a name cooler than Magnetar. And let us know if there's ever been an eclipse when all the planets have also been visible uh, during the age of photography, or even when the last time it was that you could see all of the planets in the sky during an eclipse. Tweet us at Awesome Astropod, or send an email to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Some people on Twitter have been asking us if we're on Spotify, and we are on Spotify. Yeah, so, who knew? Yeah, next time you make to like, oh, what should we listen to? You can be like, oh, bruv. Slap on some awesome astropod. Lush. <laughs> so. But we're also. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say. Go on. We're also on Podsbean. We also have a website. We're on iTunes. Basically, wherever good podcasts are found, that's where we are. So, until our space exploration show in the middle of the month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod.com or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.